Um, welcome at um, the workshop on autonomous intraluminal navigation. Uh, my name is Manu van der Poorten from KU Leuven, and then I'll be uh, kicking off this uh, workshop. I'll pre I prepared a short introduction, and I will uh, share my screen and uh, walk you through it. So um, let me start. So. I'll first give you some information on the background and the introduction. So uh, I'll start off with um, highlighting the importance of intraluminal navigation. So just one uh, particular field where this is important is our uh, cardiovascular diseases. So they are the single most common cause of death in the EU. And uh, in this field, uh, catheter procedures are among the most common surgical interventions to treat uh, CVD. In fact, if you look at um, mitral regurgitation, which is one of the um, um, symptoms and the diseases that you have, uh, almost half of the uh, people who could, who would uh, need treatment can currently not be treated because they are too old or um, if they would have surgery, they would have too high perioperative perio risks. So that's uh, uh, one of the motivations to look at more or less invasive, in this case, uh, interventions, for example, through uh, catheters. Um, so these uh, type of interventions are, are advantageous for the patient. Patients recover faster, they have less cares, uh, scars, but uh, there are quite some uh, disadvantages and challenges. So for example, for uh, surgeons, they will have a very limited view, for example, on the vessel, as you see here in this um, video, the surgeons have, are introducing guide wires and catheters, um, and they have to infer based on, on their expertise where the vessel is. Um, at the same time, they are exposed to radiation, just like their patients, so it's um, not, uh, it's suboptimal. And also maneuvering these flexible devices uh, through a complex deformable structure is not trivial. So um, the future is in, in, in the direction of uh, manipulating flexible instruments, catheters and so on, but there is, are some caveats. And uh, if we look at the learning curve, there is a big uh, learning curve. Here you see some uh, videos of, um, to the left, you see the manipulation of a catheter uh, for valve implants where that is done by an expert. And to the right, you see the trajectory that is followed by a, a novice and, or, or a, a trainee or a, a person with less experience. So you can see that the navigation, uh, the, the trajectory that is followed by the tip is much more involved in the form in the latter case. Um, and if you know that these patients are diseased uh, with, with a lot of calcium, calcium and that you do not want to dislodge that so that it gets into the brain, then you understand that this right situation is uh, far from ideal and should be avoided. So um, there is uh, the hope to use robotics to um, reduce the learning curve and improve the precision, but controlling such flexible devices is quite sophisticated and, and uh, that's actually a problem that you have in many, many disciplines. So you have like in cardiovascular, if you're navigating through the colon, uh, through the ureter or uh, going to the lungs or, or, or the esophagus, you have actually quite some commonalities amongst these uh, procedures. So if we uh, look at uh, solving um, the difficulties in one field, we may actually borrow parts and there can be a cross fertilization. And so that was actually the initiative of uh, the project Atlas that is actually um, um, the origin of this uh, workshop. So we, uh, within Atlas, we are um, training 15 PhD students to um, learn uh, to cope with that, how to develop robotics technology to improve the navigation uh, in interluminal uh, situations how to um, embed autonomy inside of these uh, systems. 
So uh, that's what is being done in Atlas. And um, for that reason, we actually also set up this workshop so that we can get a view outside of, of, of Atlas work. What is the, where is the field moving? And, and this is actually here, uh, the setup that we have. So we have uh, foreseen four talks. Uh, first, we start uh, by uh, Hedje Rafitari from Auris Robotics who will introduce uh, the current state of the art, the most advanced robotic systems around uh, in this field. And then we will move to two talks, which are more um, from an academic scientific uh, um, orientation. So it's more um, um, academic and more um, scientific, uh, but still, uh, so it's gonna be the future. Um, and then the last talk, is uh, from uh, Professor Van Leeuwen, who is actually looking at uh, nature and uh, where actually there can be some inspiration that is going to uh, affect, uh, can be introduced into this field on a, a bit longer term, but that can actually steer the developments there. Uh, so uh, at the end, we will have close the session with uh, some closing remarks. Um, luckily, I'm not alone in this um, session. so. My colleagues who are uh, co-chairing this session are uh, Dr. Benoit Rosa, uh, who uh, did his PhD in robotics in uh, Marie Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris. Uh, he won uh, with his uh, PhD thesis, the best uh, PhD thesis uh, in uh, France in 2013. Uh, he's a full-time CNRS uh, researcher. Uh, he's working in the iCube lab at the University of uh, Strasbourg. And uh, he was recently named uh, in the top three of experimental cardiac navigation papers of 2019 and 2020. And then um, uh, my more senior colleague is Professor uh, Paul Breitfeld from uh, TU Delft. Uh, he originally has a background in space um, robotics uh, and he moved to uh, the medical field. Currently he's, he's the head of the BITE, the, which stands for Bio-Inspired Technology Research Group in, in the TU Delft. He won a number of awards and prizes. Um, he's also the director of the Graduate School of the Faculty of Mechanical Maritime and Materials Engineering in TU Delft. Uh, with the next talk um, uh, from um, Mohamed Abdelaziz, so Mohammed received a bachelor degree in mechatronics engineering uh, from the German University in Cairo in 2014, and then a master's degree in robotics and mechatronics from the University of Twente in the Netherlands in 2016, and quite recently the, the PhD in MR Safe Robotics and Instrumentation from Imperial College, College London. So uh, since he, he got his PhD, he's a postdoctoral research associate at the Hamlin Center for Robotic Surgery. Uh, and so his research interests include MR-safe robotics, image-guided interventions, and uh, multimaterial, multifunctional medical devices. Um, today, he will present recent advances in endovascular catheterization uh, with his talk <laughs> entitled CathBots, a versatile and vascular robotic platform. So, um, Mohamed, if you if you can share your screen, yeah, okay, we can see your screen. Can you see? Sorry, can you see these slides? No. Uh, we see the probably your view, like the, the panelist view. This one is mine. Ah, uh, yeah, that that's that's okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks a lot, Benoit. Thanks all for joining in today, and uh, for the organizers, Benoit, Paul, Braidfield, and Manu for the invite and organizing the workshop. Um, so basically, my name is Mohammed Abdelaziz, as uh, was just mentioned, and I recently uh, received my PhD in the field of MRI robotics, uh, more specifically for the endovascular uh, theme. And uh, just as sort of a disclaimer at the beginning, I'll be, the talk will be more directed towards the 
uh, our journey towards the development of our latest iteration of the system and more so than the on autonomy aspects of it. So uh, just a recap of what was just mentioned. I received my bachelor's in mechatronics engineering from the German University in Cairo. And then I received also the master's degree in systems and control uh, from the University of Twente, where I sort of got interested more towards, you know, the, the working towards uh, medical robotics and more specifically MRI robotics. And then I was more or less hired to leverage some of the expertise I've gained in the University of Twente and MRI robotics to develop a robotic system towards uh, endovascular interventions. Um, I thought about it for a while, how to motivate kind of the work I do. And there were a couple of ways, go through the traditional way, which I just show some couple of uh, sentences and things like that. But more recently, I was asked to do a pitch for the PhD. And I thought that would be the most ideal way of um, giving you a motivation of why uh, I'm working on this, on this project or on this field. It's a very quick video. I, I hope it doesn't bore you. And from there, I'll get in more into the details and delve more into the details and technical details. So I hope the sound works. Can you hear me? Can you hear it? Um, I can't hear it, Mohamed. Mohamed, when you, uh, if you can stop sharing your screen for a second and yeah, then if you click on the up arrow to share screen, uh, I did click share sound. Sorry, yeah, share screen, and then it's share sound. Mm, I did that. You, you've you ticked that in the bottom corner, yeah? Yes. Okay. Check the volume then, maybe the volume controls. No. No. Hi, everyone. Ah, my name is Mohammed, and I'm currently finalizing my PhD at the Hamlin Center for Robotic Surgery. Cardiovascular diseases have a significant impact on populations around the world. They account for more death across the globe than any other cause. Cardiovascular diseases affect the heart and blood vessels. Endovascular interventions are minimally invasive procedures that have become the mainstay of treatments for vascular diseases. In endovascular interventions, clinicians cut very small incisions and pass flexible instruments such as catheters and guide wires to navigate through the anatomy towards the targeted diseased vessel. Once reached, several treatment options such as catheter ablations are directed towards the diseased vessel. Clinicians commonly use real-time x-ray guidance to provide a roadmap for them to guide these instruments through the body to the areas of interest. X-rays are great in terms of temporal resolution and cost effectiveness, yet still x-ray exposes the medical personnel and patients to higher doses of ionizing radiation which could lead to a sizable risk of cancer. Throughout the course of my PhD, I contributed towards the development of a versatile master-slave robotic platform to improve precision, stability, comfort, and to minimize and possibly eliminate radiation exposure for the patient and medical personnel. The platform allows clinicians to remotely manipulate commercially available instrumentation and in-house fabricated steerable catheters. The platform comprises a master manipulator that emulates conventional manipulation of instruments. Conversely, the slave robot is pneumatically actuated using 3D printed linear and rotary stepper motors. As a result of its polymeric nature, the robot also paves the way for endovascular interventions under MRI, an alternative radiation-free imaging modality which offers unparalleled visualization of soft tissue and 3D evaluations of pathology and function across the body. As our research and understanding of medical robots and devices move forward, great strides can be made towards improving the quality and safety of patient healthcare. Okay, that's it. So basically, as I Hi, this is more or less a motivation kind of pitch of what is the project about, what was my PhD uh, about as well. And sort of to give you a better overview of our system, here is the kind of the general architecture of our framework. And basically, as I said, the robot is used to perform uh, endovascular intervention, assist surgeons to perform robot, uh, endovascular interventions. And the robotic platform, uh, use a laser here, comprises a master manipulator and also includes uh, 
components such as the uh, slave robot, or we can call it now more of the remote manipulator, and and also a navigation system. And the only the robot is located within the intervention room, and the robot facilitates the uh, remote manipulation of uh, off the shelf selected captors and guide wires, which uh, follows a very similar principle to the current this platform as well. And in contrast, the uh, the controllers and everything are located outside the intervention room to remotely control the pneumatic uh, stepper motors uh, that drive the robot. And real imaging data or real data, real time, sorry, imaging data from the imaging modalities, whether it's X-ray, fluoroscopy, or MR, are uh, provided to the operator located in the control room using an image grabber. And the navigation system in general provides real time. Uh, visual guidance and uh, also image-based haptic feedback is rendered to the master manipulator to guide the third, the third uh, surgeon during the procedure. And this is more or less like a 3D CAD rendering of our compact master manipulator and the core component of this uh, human machine interface uh, considers a cylindrical handle where you can see here uh, that substitutes direct contact between the clinician and instrument. And similar to physical instrumentation, the handle can be rotated and displaced uh, linearly. And this also adapts human motion patterns of um, kind of concurrent object gripping and manipulation. And the electromechanical design applied to is applied to both degrees of freedom, which enables the rendering of torque and force feedback, as I mentioned earlier. This is the uh, also the slave robot uh, CAD and it's pneumatically actuated as I mentioned and it's 3D printed and it allows us to remotely manipulate uh, off the shelf cathodes and guide wires by emulating basically the haptic uh, master uh, device and each instrument is driven by two pneumatic uh, linear uh, stepper motors to translate the instrument and one pneumatic rotational uh, stepper motor to rotate the instruments and two pneumatic clamps to clamp while translating the instrument. And as shown in the insets here, here and here, uh, this basically facilitates the seamless switching between remote and manual operations and using quick release add-ons on the catheter and the guide wire, which uh, allows us to introduce a rotary motion uh, onto the instruments. These are more or less uh, optimized pneumatic stepper motors that we use in our system. You can see here the uh, the linear uh, motor, which consists of two sealed uh, dual acting pistons acting on a rack, and this sort of GIF uh, helps you visualize uh, how it works. And the linear motor has a step size of 0.3 millimeters. And this is the rotary stepper motor, which is placed in a uh, cross configuration as opposed to the linear. And as I said, as a result of the polymeric nature of these actuators, it allows us to uh, make use of uh, kind of an unconventional way of uh, imaging and endovascular intervention, which is MRI, which is an alternative radiation-free imaging modality, which allows us or offers uh, additional functionality uh, during uh, intervention as well. This is more or less how we set up the uh, robotic platform. We uh, insert or feed the catheter, and then we add the uh, add-ons, and then feed the guide wire, uh, followed by the add-ons of the guide wire. And then we basically dock everything onto the platform, and then we are, we're good to go. Uh, this is the master device, and the device also provides visual feedback to indicate whether the system is idle, ready, or if there's any error, so as to help support the surgeon while doing the intervention. And over here, you can see the teleoperation of the robot using the master device. And in this case, the user advances the catheter remotely using the master manipulator. And as you might have noticed, the slave concurrently grips and manipulates the catheter accordingly. And in this part, the operator is rotating the guide wire remotely. And finally here, uh, the user is remotely advancing and retracting the guide wire. The 
So over here on the left-hand side of the video is the dynamic active tracking of the vessel wall and the catheter tip. And this allows us to render the haptic feedback to the master manipulator to minimize the risk of damages to the vessel and potentially improving the overall uh, precision and safety of the intervention. And on the right-hand side is an example of the robotic versus manual uh, cannulation. And unsurprisingly, completion time is usually higher when the robot is used with respect to manual cannulations. However, the image-based haptic feedback incorporated within the uh, navigation framework I've described contributed towards the uh, reduction in the mean overall forces exerted on the phantom when the robotic system is used. So over here, over here is the uh, sort of the phantom or user study. We've, we've done a very extensive user study where we asked uh, seven clinicians to perform several tasks in, uh, in different phantoms. In, and as I said, I mean, this was a very extensive study to you know, test and uh, test the feasibility of our platform and see whether it performs as we say or not. And these are some of the uh, user study results where we performed kind of an objective assessment of the experimental uh, procedures. And what we have noticed that the completion time resulted on average slightly more than one minute longer than using a robot. And these results are obviously uh, statistically significant according to the ANOVA test. And we also, the analysis of the mean and maximum forces show that the uh, overall forces, uh, there is a reduction in the overall forces exerted on the phantoms when the uh, robot is used. And you can notice over here on this plot is the task completion time with one of the clinicians who did not have experience with the platform prior to, the, to using the platform. You can see there is an improvement or a learning curve uh, in, uh, while using the uh, platform. So that was also uh, encouraging. And subsequent to this uh, study participation, we asked clinicians to uh, complete surveys in order to uh, um, you know, evaluate the platform. And in general, the, uh, the clinicians were uh, satisfied with the system control, the precision, and acknowledged the presence of haptic feedback, which is something that's quite limited in, in current manual interventions. And subject, uh, also the clinicians were uh, appreciative of performance in specific uh, um, arteries and they also address the ergonomics and procedural safety and one of the things that motivated us uh, in terms of one of the statements was that the frequent use of this, they would recommend such systems to uh, their peers as well which is something that was encouraging uh, more recently or let's say Pre-COVID 2019 in December, we performed an uh, animal in vivo animal study as well, where we asked uh, an, an expert endovascular surgeon to cannulate and perform angioplasty uh, tasks in five target blood vessels, and the tasks were performed manually uh, on two uh, procyne models and robotically as well on two. And the metrics used for evaluation included the uh, success rate, the histopathology, and completion time. And when the robot was used, as shown here on the right-hand side for the superior mesenteric artery, the histopathology showed a lower incidence and severity of arterial injuries. Um, as I mentioned here clearly, it's two out of 78 uh, vessels were damaged, whereas in the case of uh, manual interventions, 21 sections out of 78 presented high-grade injuries. And as expected, as I have reiterated several times before, it took overall uh, more time with uh, using a robotic system, the entire uh, from start to finish of the whole procedure, uh, than uh, with the manual. And kind of finally to benefit from the unique features of MRI, which I uh, mentioned, and, and I think that's one of the things we're trying to push the boundaries of, uh, which is to uh, facilitate endovascular interventions within an MRI environment. We believe that using a robotic system would uh, make things a bit more uh, practical within an MRI environment because it 
I mean, currently procedures are performed if performed on pediatric uh, uh, patients. It's very tricky to perform endovascular in interventions within uh, an MRI bore with clinicians having suffering from musculoskeletal injuries because they need to uh, put their hands all the way in into the MRI ball, which is very tricky. So in addition to as well, the MRI being noisy, uh, inherently noisy as well, is, uh, is something that clinicians who perform actually MRI interventions do suffer and complain from as well. So having them perform surgeries remotely as well, open doors uh, within the MRI environment and allows us to benefit from all the unique features that, uh, that the MRI brings to the table as well. And over here is an MRI uh, conditional uh, guide wire being manipulated manually and then robotically. And as I said, when I say MRI conditional, because most of the catheters and guide wires available in the market right now are not suitable for MRI environments. They are not MR safe because they usually are embedded with metallic wires or metallic components. So they tend to either be uh, um, not uh, safe to use within an MRI environment or safe, but they introduce massive artifacts within the MRI imaging. So it's very hard to distinguish between the instrument and the surrounding tissue. So over here, we used an MRI conditional guide wire and we manipulate it manually and robotically. And as expected, the robot did not introduce any artifacts within the uh, images due to its polymeric nature, as I mentioned. So these are some of the references or publications we've uh, published with regards to the, uh, um, this project in general. And on a previous platform, uh, a colleague of mine worked more mostly on the autonomous cannulations of uh, uh, of, of um, these tasks, and these are three publications that I would encourage people to look into, where we basically used uh, learning-based robotic catheterization, uh, addressing the challenges of manual interventions, and also we we have a paper where we talk more into details about the haptic feedback and how we generate the haptic feedback using the image, uh, using the images we acquire from the imaging modality. We also talk about the, we have a paper about the segmentation and tracking of the different, uh, of the different instruments as well. And the one I extensively talked about today is the design and preliminary study of the uh, robotic platform and the user study as well. And Hopefully within the next couple of months, you will be uh, seeing as well uh, our extensive animal study, uh, the preclinical study uh, paper on that as well. So I would like to acknowledge all the uh, many talented and dedicated uh, and skilled colleagues that I've worked and had the honor to work with. And I would also appreciate, uh, acknowledge the EPSRC for funding this work and yeah. I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for the nice presentation. Um, there was a first question by Ali Nazari in the in the chat. Um, so it's a, it's about the the bending of the catheter tip. So um, you know, in your in your uh, in in what you showed, you show only translation both on the master device and on the slave device. And the question is, how is the, the bending handled? Uh, is there any human control? Is it automated? So, so can you tell a bit more about that? So currently, I mean, the one, the, the, the things I just showed were uh, focused on selective catheters and uh, selective guide wires. Uh, and what I mean by selective catheters is that the uh, tip of the catheters are have a fixed P shape. So that's what mm -hmm. they are commonly used within endovascular interventions. However, there are obviously steerable catheters and that's something that we have worked on as well, which is to extend the system to accommodate steerable catheters as well that are off the shelf. So basically you will take a catheter, a steerable catheter and a ablation catheter for instance, and you would dock this catheter onto the robotic platform and you can drive the knob that steers the distal end of the uh, catheter. So it's more of a hybrid between the, the pull wires or tendons that drive the tip of the catheter and our pneumatic system that 
automates or sort of uh, allows you to robotically control the tip of the catheter. So the one I just showed right now has a fixed distal end and that fixed distal end cannot be steered on this. Okay, there, there was a, an, another question in a chat related to um, comparison with available systems. So there are, there are a few commercially available uh, systems for endovascular catheterization. So what's, what's the, what, what does your system bring on top of what's existing? So currently, I mean, I didn't talk much about it, is that we are trying to push forward towards the MRI domain. So mm -hmm. most of the experiments we've done were within a fluoroscopy setting due to the availability, the more availability of fluoroscopy. However, as I said, since the platform is MR safe completely, I mean, the whole thing is made out of plastic. There's no, no metal at all, no metallic components that allows us to push towards the MRI environment and encourage a lot of other clinicians as well to pursue MRI guided in interventions and uh, perform surgeries within the MRI setting where they can not only just diagnose the patient and perform the surgery, also evaluate the treatment uh, within a single intervention. So that's kind of our vision and aim and that's what we are pursuing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe related to that, to the uh, actually both to fluoroscopy and, and going towards MR, uh, is that and that's something that is often seen with robotic systems is that uh, operation time is longer, and this is also something that was seen in in, in your in your experiments. Um, so on the fluoroscopy guidance, that means longer fluoroscopy time, I suspect. Uh, which may not be uh, um, the best for the patient. Um, but even, even when you're going towards MR, you know, uh, the, the, the cost of operating an MR system is, is huge. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you, where do you put that balance between having a robotic system that brings safety uh, or maybe um, brings advantages, but uh, uses uh, a lot of, uh, MR room time, which is a, which is something uh, which is a, expensive. A, a, a expensive and a, a re resource, a rare resource in a hospital. Uh, so, so where do you put that balance? So, I mean, the numbers we've given are just the, the numbers we've calculated. We know we had some kind of limitations within the system in terms of hardware, and obviously, in future iterations of the hardware, we will circumvent these problems, and we believe we can put this down further down. So for instance, if I say 20 minutes at the moment that it takes longer, then I'll be able to bring it down to five minutes or so. And these were limitations during the intervention itself in terms of this, the design of the platform itself, that would lower it down. And another thing I think that people sometimes forget is that uh, clinicians have years and years of experience of performing manual intervention. So if you're gonna compare a clinician who just met the robot and started using the robot and expecting him to perform exactly the same uh, at the same level of uh, so i think it's kind of an unfair kind of comparison but as i said i mean i think with the learning curve and that's something we we've shown a couple of times that the learning curve is really uh, uh, i think is encouraging and we've seen clinicians get the hang of it in a few minutes, I mean, they just do the intervention once and they, oh, they understand the system, especially with the master device that I've shown, the fact that it mimics very well the uh, how you would manipulate instruments normally in a, in a manual setting, allowed them to learn, I mean, learn very quickly how to use the platform. So I think there is room for improvement from, at the, from a time standpoint, but I think we, need, we don't need to forget as well the, the, the force or the haptic feedback feature as well that allows us to perform a more safe intervention. So the quick answer is we're working on it. And at the same time, I think we can get to a point, an optimal point where we have a safe intervention with a competitive kind of time, uh, time standpoint where we can perform a robotic surgery within the same time frame as a manual uh, intervention. Thanks a lot for the, for the interesting discussion. Unfortunately, we, we're running out of time. Uh, so um, we're going to 
I'm going to give the floor to, to uh, Paul Bredveld to introduce the next speaker. Thanks again, um, Hamed, for your, for your interesting talk and discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Benoit. I hope I'm, uh, I'm audible. <laughs> yeah. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Emiliano Vota, from, uh, who is an associate professor at the Politecnico uh, di Milano. He's an expert on uh, cardiovascular biomechanics and also de designing new implantable devices and developing surgical techniques. He's also the founder, one of the founders of a 3D computer simulation lab and also of a company called Artines that's developing technology for surgical and transcatheter procedures. And uh, finally, he is also part of an Arteri EU project. So I think there's a lot of interesting things you can uh, you can tell us about. So I think I would like to give to give the floor to you. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. Uh, so first of all, can you hear me properly? Yeah? Yes, very well. Okay. So it, it's a bit awkward to be connected to an event in London these days, if you're Italian, but uh, I, I'll try to avoid being too smiley. Anyways, no, stop kidding. Uh, I'm here to talk about our uh, European project, R3. Um, so uh, I'll go straight to my slides by sharing my screen. Uh, there we go. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So the, the Artery project started uh, exactly at the beginning of the current year. It involves seven partners. Uh, these include uh, one very large and specialized hospital in Milan, the Hospitale San Raffaele. We have two small media enterprises. Those are FBGS and Swiss Vortex, located in Belgium and Switzerland, respectively. And then the, the uh, partners include also, oh, sorry, we have Artness, which you already mentioned, which is a very small company in Italy. And then we have three universities. Uh, one of them is KU Leuven from Belgium. The remaining two are from Italy. They are Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna di Pisa and Politecnico di Milano. So as you said, uh, I'm an expert in cardiovascular biomechanics. I am no expert in robotics. So uh, I, I hope that still we'll be able to give you some interesting hints. The, the focus of the project is on structural heart diseases, which are a subclass of cardiovascular diseases. It has been said quite a lot already about uh, cardiovascular diseases. So I'll go straight to the subclass. Uh, structural heart diseases account more or less for 30% of all cardiovascular diseases. And among these, they are basically the, the most deadly ones and the most challenging one to treat. Uh, typically, uh, the treatment involves open chest surgery, which is of course very invasive, very painful after the procedure. Uh, in many cases, it is a high risk type of intervention, especially if patients are elderly people, newborns, or more in general subjects that have other co comorbidities. This is exactly the reason why percutaneous interventions in, the, in this context were introduced. Uh, the idea is basically to access uh, the heart by means of a catheter that is inserted from a peripheral access, typically at the level of the legs. Uh, the catheter is run either through veins or arteries to the heart where a device is delivered to replace a diseased native structure or to repair the structure. Uh, typically these catheters are long, have a quite large number of uh, degrees of freedom. And this makes it absolutely not trivial to maneuver the proximal end, so the gears and, and the various controls and at the same time to, let's say, predict in a one-to-one in -one correspondence, what would be the effect at the opposite end of the system. So typically these procedures are very tricky, uh, especially when it comes to 
carrying them out in an unconfined space. So here in this slide, I give you two examples. On the left-hand side, you see probably the most common procedure. This is TAVI. So it's the replacement of an aortic valve. In this case, the path to the target is confined, is defined by, by the aorta, which is a vessel, a complex one, but still it's a pipe. But whenever you need to target uh, structures that are really inside the heart chambers as for the mitral valve, then uh, your environment looks more like a pretty large sphere. And so you have no guidance by the surrounding structures, basically. Also, in this case, the target is very, very dynamic. Uh, of course, you don't have direct vision of the target in these procedures. So to compensate for this, uh, clinical imaging is adopted. So every uh, procedure is carefully planned based on pre-op CT scans, whereas during the procedure, fluoroscopy is used in every phase of the procedure. So either uh, over the traveling of, of the catheter to the heart or when the catheter uh, still has already reached the heart, sorry. In this second phase, also 3D ultrasound is typically adopted and is heavily relied on. Of course, the problem here is fluoroscopy because of x-rays. These are dangerous to the patient, but even more, they are dangerous to operators because these uh, carry out multiple procedures over every day. There is a maximum number of procedures at this initially that these people are allowed to carry out over the year to avoid major damages. But still, there is an increasing rate of cases of retinal damage, uh, cases of brain tumors, hand tumors, and so forth because of uh, repeated X-ray exposure. I don't know why it's not running anymore. Okay, so procedures are carried out in a so-called cath lab. If you would look uh, on Google images, let's say, for an idealized version of this environment, you would find an image like this one, which is good because it gives you an idea of the hardware you will find in this place. Typically, you have a sonographer here on the left just to acquire 3D ultrasound images, a C-arm to acquire fluoroscopy, and you have the physical monitors where images uh, are, sh are, are shown. Uh, and in this picture, you only see two operators, but this is not really realistic. In the real world, what you will see would look much more like this. A bunch of people discussing in a small room in front of images where it's not always easy to interpret things. Uh, for instance, look at this image, basically a high uh, part, sorry, a high fraction of the image is occupied by an artifact, which hinders the possibility to clearly see the structures. And these people have to handle controls that can be as complex as the one I'm showing here. Very large, a lot of nodes. So basically there are several open issues in terms of safety. We have radiation exposure. We have no direct vision, which makes it more uncertain to control the, heart, the entire system. Images are not so easy to interpret. Again, uncertain in the procedure. The target is typically anatomically complex and highly dynamic. This means that operators are experiencing a huge mental workload. They can make mistakes because of this. And also there is an extremely steep learning curve for the most complex procedures. As a consequence, basically only in high volume centers, you have a at least decent level of uh, the operators and a very low level of mortality or of undesired adverse events in these procedures. And this of course limits the access to the of the population to this kind of treatment. And that's of course a, a great pity. This leads to our goals. So within our project, we aim to shift the paradigm of uh, percutaneous interventions in the heart to a radiation-free approach to allow for a very intuitive navigation of intraoperative clinical imaging and to allow for a very intuitive and simple control of the catheter. The final goal is of course to make the procedures simpler, which means also safer and more widely accessible by 
patients. To do so, we decided to leverage on four technologies, basically augmented reality, robotic sensing and actuation, computer modeling and artificial intelligence, and to mix them up to get a platform. In this platform at the center, we have two standard pieces of hardware. So the surgical table and the sonographer. That's everything that should be remain uh, from the classic cath lab. We will have two robots. A first one will be devoted to handling the ultrasound catheter, so the probe. The second one instead will be devoted to the delivery catheter, so the catheter that will bring to the heart whatever has to be implanted. The operator will be allowed to interact with these robotic arms by means of augmented reality. During the intravascular phase, these means will be used to basically visualize the route of the catheter over the vessels through the skin of the patient. Once the catheter will reach the heart, uh, augmented reality will be used to visualize 3D ultrasound data to navigate them, to zoom them as much as you like, but also to visualize on the data extra information that will be automatically delivered by the uh, uh, real-time analysis of the data by means of an artificial intelligence system. All this information will allow the user to decide how to move the tip. And the really cool thing we want to achieve is that the user would simply say through the augmented reality interface, okay, the tip should have that final pose within the heart. That's it. He doesn't have to think about how to manipulate the proximal driver of the system because the information from the operator as well as the information of the 3D ultrasound will feed a second artificial module that, that will lead to basically drive the two robotic arms so to move the delivery catheter accordingly and to allow the ultrasound catheter to be fine-tuned and all, always follow in the optimal fashion what is going on to the delivery catheter. That, that's the ideal goal we are pursuing. We will try this on two use cases. The first one is the mitral clip system. That's a system devoted to the repair of the mitral valve in case of mitral valve regurgitation. It's nearly the most complex system you can find on the market. So it's a very challenging benchmark. And we will just modify the already existing system so to add sensors and robotize uh, the system. On the right hand side, we, you have an example of a system to uh, close the left atrial appendage. That's something you do when you have a, a high risk of stroke in a patient. In this case, the systems on the market at, are much more simple than the microclip one. And we aim to design ex novo a, a, catheter, a robotized catheter system, which should be the most exploitable product of our project. So where are we after six months, roughly, since the start of the project? Uh, we did many things, a little bit of everything, so I just picked a few examples. In terms of hardware development, we focus on the proximal actuators. Uh, so as far as the ultrasound catheter is concerned, we don't see big problems. As you see in this picture, you have a limited number of degrees of freedom from the, for this catheter. The catheter is not so small as basically uh, one centimeter in diameter at the tip, which is the thickest part of the catheter. It's quite heavy. And because of this, a pre-existing solution designed at KUL was deemed suitable to uh, move the catheter in a robotic fashion. The original system is quite large and it will be miniaturized in the next months. You can see here a preliminary test on a catheter which is just moved back and forth inside basically a very simple phantom of a hypothetical vessel. Uh, as far as the delivery system is concerned, well, this is going to be a much more 
let's say complicated, but at the same time, probably fun process. The system is extremely complex. The cutter is thinner. Also, you have a guide wire on top of that. You have a steerable sheet here. Plus inside the sheet, you have the actual delivery system. And this complicates everything. And if you look inside the controls, you can appreciate the amount of gears that you have there, which are also rather stiff. Actually, it's difficult for a human operator to just rotate things easily. It takes some effort. So we have some solutions that are under development at KUL, but I cannot share them, I'm afraid. Uh, we also focused on the sensorization of the catheters. Probably we'll, we'll end up equipping the system with electromagnetic sensors on the very tip of the system, uh, mostly on the sheath, which is the gray part here. Whoops. And we will also explore at the same time FBG based shape sensing. So uh, basically uh, fiber brack uh, phenomena. So to be able to measure uh, bending in the 3D space of the catheter. Uh, as far as the intravascular monitoring of the catheter is concerned, we rely on numerical modeling so to simulate the catheter advancing inside a vessel. We decided to use SOFA as a numerical solver. That's an open source platform developed in France. Uh, it is suitable for our purposes because it allows basically to drive the tip of the catheter based on the information we have from the real sensors on the system. And at the same time, you can generate in real time new pieces of catheter at the proximal end and impose an axial velocity, which is what will occur in the real system as we'll have the axial motion imposed by the robotic uh, actuator. Uh, we are a little bit struggling with the stability of the model because of the technical solutions implemented in this solver, but it looks like we are managing to solve the issues. Uh, as far as the intracardiac monitoring instead is concerned, we are now in the process of building the training set for a convolutional neural network for the segmentation of the, of the 3D ultrasound data. Uh, the interesting thing is that so far we of course labeled manually the uh, data we had at our disposal, but so to let's say limit this manual operation, which would be extremely time consuming if carried out completely in a manual fashion, we implemented an ad hoc tracking system so that for every patient we just act manually in one frame and in the next 30 to 35 frames of the cardiac cycle, everything is carried out automatically. So this is already a nice uh, result because we didn't find anything like this in the literature. And in this way, we managed to identify the catheter tip, which is in light blue here in the image. Uh, the leaflets of the valve, those are the brown membranes you see there and the annulus, which is the green line that runs around the leaflets. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to share with you so far. Of course, I will be happy to answer your questions. And these are our contacts uh, here on the right. You can see the Twitter account of the project, the project website. So please feel free to get in contact with me or to go there to have news. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for your very nice uh, presentation, Dr. Volta. If there are any questions, you can please put them in the Q&A. And uh, of course, I have also a question myself. I was wondering, um, you showed all kind of interesting ideas for this uh, augmented reality interface, uh, which should solve, as I understood, the mental load issues from the, from the, yeah, the, the cardiologist. But I was wondering, when I, was, when I was looking at it, doesn't it give so much information that it will give new mental load issues that you kind of get kind of overload of information or are you not expecting that? Okay. Uh, 
that, that's a very nice comment, actually. So our idea is to basically uh, provide the end user with the same type of, let's say, standard information he or she would receive uh, with the classic system. So you will have basically in the 3D space, in your physical space, the, the 3D hologram of the acquired volume, but at the same time, we will uh, yield the 2D cap views that the operator would typically exploit to understand where the tip is with respect to the key anatomical structures. The, the nice thing is that basically you can uh, either tilt or shift those cut views with simple hand gestures without directly uh, acting on the probe because everything is already there. You don't need to, to, to move it or, or, or to manipulate the sonographer. And of course, because you have the artificial intelligence, you can have quantitative information in real time. So things like, okay, the tip is, I don't know, three centimeters away from, from that target. And right now it, it has that inclination in space with respect to that axis. That, that, that's one part of the story. The other important thing is that basically we will have an avatar of, of the tip, which will be grasped by, by the actual hands of the user and brought to the final pose. So, so no other inputs, just take the object virtually, place it where you would like it to, to end up uh, with that orientation 3D space. If it's okay, just say, okay, I'm happy with it. And that's the only input the user should give. This was actually the, the initial sparkle of the entirety of the project, simplifying this step which was a request by, by an expert operator. Uh, and then of course we, we realized that to do that, then you need uh, to, to control them catheter and to have a robotic system, which needs to sensing, which needs of course to navigation and all of the other things in the project. So nice, <laughs> it sounds rather challenging, but very interesting. And I was also wondering uh, when you go to the other side, to the control side of this uh, of this system. Uh, of course, there is the maneuvering, but there are also certain tip tools that you want to design. So, also from the handle point of view, it seems to me quite quite interesting and challenging how to make handles that the user can control, but at the same time having an incredible functionality given that the user doesn't have 10 hands, you have to somehow, are you also going to do research on that? No, okay. So uh, the two use cases I, I, I showed, they are basically the, the two ends of the spectrum. And in both cases, the, the, the issue you are mentioning is avoided uh, because it would have been too challenging, honestly. So uh, for the MitroFlip system, uh, the, the, the amount of degrees of freedom is so large that probably there is no way to conceive a, a new uh, handle that is more effective than the current one. So the idea is to basically act on the, the current mechanisms just by robotic actuators somehow. Um, and that of course skips the, 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 the step of designing the handle uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a system that's for the left atrial appendage closure where you actually have no, no gears at all. Everything is done by the hand because basically the, the degrees of freedom that you have are back and forth translation and rotating around the axis, with, which is done by the fingers. Uh, very, very recently, which means probably in the last month, maybe two months, uh, a catheter of that kind was introduced in the market. And that's the only case of steerable catheter for that application. But all the other catheters are pre-shaped, uh, which again uh, means that uh, unless we want to do something really, really uh, breakthrough, uh, we don't need to design a handle. Oh, that, uh... That sounds good, uh, as not to make it too complex. 
Yeah. So I would like to uh, wish you a lot of success with this uh, project. There's one question in the uh, Q&A, but it is a little bit specific. So maybe you could have a look at it yourself and answer yeah. it. Sure. And then again, thanks a lot. And then uh, I think uh, we have to switch to the next uh, presentation, which will be given by uh, Professor Johan van Leeuwen. So among uh, all these uh, stories about uh, interesting robotic devices and, uh, and technology, now we will have a story of a biologist who is exploring uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, animals that uh, can be very interesting to somehow mimic or imitate. So uh, I think Emiliano, you were still sharing your presentation or something, maybe not. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Johan van Leeuwen, who is a very known biologist, very famous biologist uh, working at the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands. And uh, now yeah, he's doing wonderful research on all kinds of animals, especially soft bodied animals or wasps, exploring their, uh, their uh, yeah, internal mechanisms. So now I think, uh, Johan, I would like to give the floor to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, is everyone able to see my screen at the moment? Yes, but you are not yet presenting, I think. Yeah, so, uh, I will. Yes, yeah, perfect. is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm intending to give you two examples today of smart designs in nature. Now, smart designs, uh, design um, uh, is maybe a word I shouldn't use because uh, it, 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 it is um, developed through evolution. So there's not uh, a big designer uh, behind it. At least that's my vision on nature. Uh, if, if you think otherwise, you are, of course, free to do so. Um, so uh, the topics that I would like to address is the wasp uh, ovipositor. So that is a needle-like structure that is used to lay eggs. And that has been the inspiration for steerable medical uh, needles. Um, and uh, also the soft tentacle dynamics in squid. I'm, I'm not sure whether I can do them both, otherwise I, uh, I will just do the wasp and uh, uh, Maybe you will uh, meet me at another occasion where I could uh, uh, talk about um, the squid. I, I will I will actually concentrate on the biomechanical mechanisms. So I stay largely within nature, and um, uh, because that's that's my uh, task also as a zoology to zoologist actually to unravel these kind of mechanisms. So, okay, the wasp ovipositor, um, uh, by the way, there are uh, loads of other insects uh, like wasps and emipteras, the uh, true bugs, and they have mouth parts uh, with also steerable needle systems which work in a similar way uh, to what we find in the, in the wasps. Uh, but um, uh, it, yeah, for instance, the, the, the mosquitoes use actually six mouth uh, elements for it, and the emipterans use four elements, uh, whereas the wasps uh, use three elements. Uh, the principles are actually similar. So once you understand, I think, the, the wasp, you can understand the other two uh, uh, relatively easy. So I will, I will go into the uh, anatomy. I will go into the kinematics, the stiffness and bending, and very, very shortly to the actuation of the system. Um, and uh, yeah, so here, here at the left side, you see uh, actually uh, a wasp, uh, and and here you see the ovipositor that that is uh, 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 projected into uh, 
transparent gel that we actually use to visualize the motions in 3D. And here you see actually a lot thicker structure that are sheaths that envelop uh, the ovipositor. So the ovipositor that you see here is only 30 microns thick. Uh, and most of the actuation, uh, yeah, the complete actuation is actually in within the abdomen of, uh, of the insects. So if we look at the tip, we see here actually one dorsal element, and you see here a ventral element of, of this uh, tiny needle. Uh, there are actually, if you, if you take a cross section here, about here, then you see here the dorsal element, and here you see um, you see a ventral element and here an other ventral element, and uh, they are connected by uh, tongue and groove mechanisms. One here at the right hand side, one here at the left hand side, and then of course the ovipositor has to deposit uh, eggs. And where do they go? Where you have here in the center actually a kind of narrow hole. And so uh, originally this egg is more or less spherical, but it deforms into a, a cigar and then is transported through the system. I will not address this intriguing transport system actually uh, today. And here you see um, uh, actually the tongue and groove mechanisms, which is only a few microns. So to make this technically would be very uh, challenging, but uh, at least the wasp is able to do this. Um, then there are some challenges for uh, probing. You have the penetration. So um, uh, yeah, uh, and the wasp should avoid excessive uh, buckling actually that uh, that could damage its uh, probe and often the upper surface of the plants uh, etc that they stick into uh, to to actually uh, and they try to find a host and for instance a, a fruit fly larvae uh, into uh, into a piece of fruit and so they they can search with their needle into the fruit tissues for this uh, host. And then once the egg is in the host, the uh, egg will grow and the larvae will actually eat uh, uh, and the whole host away until it breaks out. It's uh, rather cruel, I have to say. And uh, well, once you are in the tissue, of course, you have the propagation and the increased friction. So how does the uh, animal deal with that? And then uh, the animal uh, needs to be able to steer into various directions. Uh, it, it also has miniature uh, sensory systems in it, uh, chemical ones and mechanical ones to uh, enable it actually to find the host. Um, OK. Um, so how do you avoid buckling? Well, then we can go to a beam. And the equation for a beam is actually uh, you get buckling at a particular critical load when you reach, uh, when, when the load reaches this value and well this is just pi and this is the uh, 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 this is the Young's modulus of um, of the beam this is the uh, second moment of area of the beam this is the length and this is a factor that depends on the clamping so is it free or is it clamped um, now and what can you easily do is increase the, mo uh, the second moment of area. And that's a geometrical property of the cross section. And uh, there the sheaths actually come in. So here, these, uh, these two black uh, bars here, 
So uh, especially when you have a large distance from the center, you increase very easily uh, this, uh, this second moment of uh, area. So initially during the puncture, the sheaths are actually in place, but they can go away uh, as soon as, as say the ovipositor itself is within the tissue. So another um, an, an um, uh, way to reduce uh, the chances of any buckling is, of course, to reduce the net external load. So you have these multiple elements, and you can uh, pull them, and you can push them uh, once you go through it. And then uh, on a single element, when, when this is uh, actually pushed in, it will experience a, a frictional load from the neighbors here, uh, a frictional load from the substrate, and also a load here at, at the tip. And, and you see here, you have often a serration at the tip. Uh, and that means that the resistance can be asymmetrical once you pull or uh, once you push. And that's important. So, okay, how, how can we then advance in the substrate without any pushing actually? Because that is, that is the, the smartness in this uh, solution, at least one of the aspects of it. So uh, if we consider say the forces on a single element, uh, then we have the external uh, uh, force here exerted by the abdomen of the uh, animal. You have the neighboring forces of the neighboring elements. You have the substrate frictional forces, and you have the forces of the tip. And here we have the inertial term. So this is uh, nothing else than a neutral second law. Uh, and uh, when you add uh, everything up for all the elements, so in the wasp, that is three. Uh, in other animals, it can be uh, up to six. And then you get it, and uh, at this, and you get rid of the neighboring uh, forces uh, and before, uh, because they cancel. So that's just, uh, it's just a sum. Then uh, what is then the requirement for the penetration with net negative, so a pulling force? So you you go inwards while pulling at the system. That's possible. Uh, here I have the external force, so it's rewriting this, uh, this equation. So you end up that this whole lot of these forces of the protracting elements. So I split them up now in protracting and going forward uh, elements the forces on them and the retracting elements, uh, yeah, those, those that, you, that you withdraw uh, towards the animal. Um, and then this is the inertial term. Um, and that should be smaller than zero. Um, and if we ignore the very small inertial term, then you can see um, we can uh, we can bring this term to the uh, other side, and then we get this. So the in uh, absolutely you should um, have lower uh, protracting forces, of course, than retracting uh, retracting. So that means that your pulling force is higher than your pushing force. How can you achieve that? You, can, you need that the surface of the protracting elements is smaller than the surface of the retracting elements to have higher uh, friction forces in the retracting elements. And if you keep the number of protracting elements low compared to the number of retracting elements, so that means you only push one element forward Whereas you don't uh, do that with the other elements, you, you, you exert a slight pull, um, a backwards pull, so no push, that helps. 
Uh, and uh, because you have the non-symmetrical forces in the forward and reverse directions at the tip due to the serrations, that also helps. So it's easier to push them forward than, the, and than to push them backwards. So, and that means that the net force yeah, can actually be negative, the net uh, pushing force. And that, um, and that, uh, yeah, then you don't need uh, the additional support any, anymore to, to uh, prevent buckling, but you can also e e easily go through a substrate and then you would have a motor, you could even detach the whole animal and that could be a transport mechanism. Now we, we collaborate a lot with the University of Delft and I see Paul uh, smiling because he is exploiting all those nice features to build uh, medical needles and also to make those uh, uh, tiny robots that can propel themselves. But this is the, uh, the very principle that has been invented by nature in, in, in the simplest mathematical terms. Um, so how about then measuring the motions of the actual animal? So what we did is we had a wasp here on the gel, uh, and then at, at the bottom we had a larvae of a fruit fly, and, and, and we had some, some odors here at the top so that it could um, actually, um, it was motivated to, to actually search for the uh, larvae. Uh, so we had two high-speed video cameras here on the top, one here and one there. So uh, that allowed us to have three-dimensional image also of what the wasp is doing. And we had um, um, yeah, uh, parallel light beams to actually enhance the depth of field. Um, so that, uh, that is the, um, and we had automated uh, motion analysis because we, we made uh, a lot of movies of them. So here you see the wasps. So uh, this is from uh, another camera actually from, uh, from the lateral side. So here you see the sheath and here you see the ovipositor and then it drives it in. And then at some moment, you see that the sheath ac actually buckle away, yeah? Um, so that's, uh, so here, here you see movies where we can look at what, where the uh, ovipositor goes in the gel. So initially it was pushing this way and then in this way. So yeah, it can push from the outside in any directions. And, and, and you see that this animal doesn't need any rotation of its body. It can just stay where it is. We uh, check that also for with with a video from above. And here at the right hand side, you see the extreme flexibility. And so one probing action where it is actually searching and taking. Um, it can also record vibrations and chemical. Uh, while doing that. Okay. Um, so we recorded loads of motions of multiple animals. And here you see at the left hand side, you see the, the records of one of these uh, attempts of an animal. Yeah? So, and here from the top, you see that in two gels, one is, is, is with a low concentration and high concentration, the high concentration actually stiffer. So there is a slight tens uh, a tendency that the animal reaches further to the side with its, uh, when it has a, uh, a weaker gel, a uh, less stiff uh, gel. But as you can see, with respect to the animal, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it can go around this whole circle if you look from above. Yeah? And, and when you look from the side, then you see this. So effectively, what this animal is able to, 
is to uh, search in half a sphere for the larvae. And that's amazing. So it's, it's a huge curvature that it can reach. It, it operates, it's from the abdomen. Uh, and um, yeah, so this machinery has actually led to, I, uh, I remember it uh, roughly uh, 180,000 different species of these kind of wasps. So this was a key invention for the ev evolution to actually benefit from all kinds of hosts. Um, so let's uh, go to the fourth. And so the valves are the elements. Eh? So you have the dorsal one here and the ventral one here. So, and what you actually see is that they move up, uh, up and down with respect to each other. So we have, we have a kind of offset and we can actually plot it through time. And we have, we have access to the speed of, of the valves and also their uh, relative offset. Uh, and what you already see, so it curves, and, and what it can do is make an asymmetrical tip, and it helps to bend. Um, so here you see another record where you have a straight insertion, uh, um, and so it's going more or less straight, and then we see here an alternating uh, dorsal and ventral valve speed, and here you have uh, you have two phases where uh, they do it in synchrony. This was the soft gel. So in the soft gel, they are also able to just push and to go forward. Uh, uh, um, but usually they alternate. And they, uh, in, in a very stiff gel, they have to rely on the alternating motion. And here you see the tip orientation, the red. So it's very, very small. So it's a straight path here. And here you see the offset between the valves. Now we go to the next one. And this is a curved path. And what you already see is that we have phases where actually the ventral valve is sticking out a lot. And once it does so, it, it it goes into an other direction because of this asymmetrical curved uh, tip. And here you see that they go more or less in synchrony, but not exactly. Otherwise, they would not be able to make, uh, to make an offset. And here you see that the uh, tip orientation varies a lot eh, in contrast to the, to the straight uh, uh, path. Um, so we can conclude now that the, that the buckling is prevented with the external sheets and the low uh, pushing force or even negative pushing uh, forces. Of course, the substrate affects the kinematics a lot and the speed, the curvature, and the type. It is the interaction is extremely hard to model. If you want to model this, uh, then uh, well, go ahead with it because that is that is really very a very complex um, interaction that's going on. Uh, uh, we have the alternating uh, motions always say in in the stiffest uh, gels, but not always required in the soft uh, gel. So, and when it is going straight, uh, we have predominantly a dorsal valve production. When it is curved, we have um, the ventral valves uh, protecting, uh, protecting. So then uh, the steering. So uh, obviously when you have um, an asymmetrical tip like here, a bevel uh, tip, then, uh, then there is a lateral force component, so that tends to uh, uh, deviate the path. So how can you then deform the tip? Well, this is one mechanism where you have a kind of interaction here when you push or pull one, uh, then, then you go to the, uh, to the left or to the right. Um, here you have, um, you have a system where you have a pretension. So the tip, uh, when you extend, 
it bends. Yeah, and and here you can see when 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 you have a variable stiffness along the uh, along the probes, uh, you can um, if you shift them along um, each other, uh, and you can have huge uh, differences in the curvature. Okay, so uh, we have um, a straight insertion mainly dorsal valve uh, protection. Uh, uh, and mainly ventral valve uh, protraction when we have a curved insertion. So um, when we take uh, when we take the system out of out of the substrate and manipulate it ourselves, then this is uh, this is the neutral position. So when we project the ventral valve, you see that this curvature vanishes and that's because this part of the dorsal valve is very stiff. Um, once we do the reverse, it also vanishes. So uh, that uh, and so this is um, uh, this is a mechanism to change here actually the local curvature of, of the beam. And we see that when you uh, Protract uh, the ventral valve, then it will bend in this direction. Okay. Now, what we also did is we we made measurements of the geometry and and we estimated material properties. I go now a bit a bit faster. The geometry was was measured with uh, the Swiss light source. Um, uh, where you have high intensity uh, X-rays, where you can reach high resolutions, so we could uh, measure with uh, with this system the anatomy in great detail, especially around the tip. Um, Go on, if I may interfere, it's a slowly time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And we also did the histology. Um, uh, and you can do more or less the same. So what we uh, did is we measured uh, we measured actually the second moment of area, and uh, for the whole beam and also for the other uh, for the for the ventral valves and for the dorsal valves. Um, and we did three point bending uh, measurements on on the systems, and then we could. Um, we could compute EI, which is the effective stiffness of the system, and also the the, the Young's modulus of the system. So we uh, that uh, that was our way actually to get uh, measurements of uh, and so of the so of the second moment of area and and also the stiffness uh, of of the material um, and. Uh, if you then go to the actual mechanism, then what you see is here, this is the neutral uh, position. When you push this forward, this will straighten out and you get an, uh, a force directed from this side on the system. And when you do the reverse, you get also an asymmetrical force. And that's how you can manipulate the tip. Um, right. Then we looked also at the abdomen. I'm nearly there. Uh, also with the Swiss light beam, so we could uh, we could take uh, uh, images of the skeleton inside, but also reconstruct the muscles. And then what you see is the dorsal valve actually connects to this element, and you have the ventral valves. They bend here. So they run into the, and they attach to this uh, skeletal element. So you have a rotating motion that is converted in a, in a linear motion here. And there are two main muscles that drive the system. So once you pull this back, uh, you have a protraction of the dorsal valves. And once you do the reverse, uh, the ventral valves actually 
of the uh, uh, fact. There are two groups that I know of that worked on those types of needles. That is, that is Imperial College. They also made a tongue and groove mechanism. So, uh, and they, and they used four elements instead of, uh, yeah, here, here's a version, I think, uh, also of three. Uh, yeah, but they also used four. Yeah? And, and then in Delft, they uh, combine uh, the, the, the needle elements, they increase the needle elements, and then uh, ended up with seven. So with a central one, by not making those tongue in groove mechanisms, but having an external sheet around it. And the advantage of the latter is actually that you can make it thinner. Then Paul will be able to answer all the questions of those, of those mechanisms because he was involved. Uh, I think both, both designs I like. Uh, and they have their uh, uh, pros and cons, obviously. So I, I, I end up with this movie. So I'm not going to tell you more about the, uh, the script because I don't have the time. But uh, this is an animal that is uh, almost uh, uh, completely a build of soft tissues. And I think if you look at needles and um, uh, other systems, what these animals have in the tentacles actually is um, that they have they have a motor system that uh, is distributed along the length of the of the tentacles and the arms. So um, and they can regulate the stiffness in smart ways they can also attach with their uh, 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 suckers to all kinds of systems and we can still learn a lot from it but it was all already uh, a large inspiration for, for uh, especially the team in Delft to build uh, various medical devices. Johan I am afraid I have to stop you now. Yeah <laughs> well, thank you very much. There is one, one question, uh, but it's in the Q&A, but it's more a comment. What a beautiful and complete conference. And I fully agree on it. That uh, it was a very nice uh, lecture. Maybe a, a small uh, comment. The needles that we designed in the end are now uh, uh, about uh, 0 0.4 millimeter thick overall. So we, we came quite, quite small. Although uh, still much thicker than the uh, than the ovipositor itself. So, uh, Johan, I would like to to thank you very much, and uh, I must say that uh, I like the work workshop as a whole really very much. And it's a bit funny that that normally uh, in science you start with questions and then you do research. And then you uh, develop your first, uh, yeah, you, 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 you apply for the research grants, you, you develop your first prototypes. And in the end, if you manage, you have a commercial product. But in this workshop, in this, work, in this uh, workshop, it, it went the other way around. So we actually started with a commercial product. Then we went, uh, 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 that was the presentation from Hedje. Then we went to uh, very interesting research, Mohammed. Then, we, we, we continued with a project that's just running for six months now. It was uh, Emiliana. And then we ended with research on, uh, yeah, on, uh, on, on, uh, on wasps. And we ended actually with a big question. So how does this squid work? But there was no time anymore to, anymore to tell it. Sorry about so it. Normally, uh, uh, um, uh, normally uh, such a conference ends with all kinds of solutions, but in this case, it ends merely with questions, new questions. So I think we have to uh, invite our speakers again, especially Johan, to tell more about the squid. But overall, I found it very enjoyable, and uh, it was uh, really nice to hear you all and to see uh, all these novel uh, uh, ideas and, uh, and constructions, and then uh, to end with biology that can do it much better, of course. That's really nice. 
Is there anything, uh, uh, Johan, maybe as a final question, in which mankind is better than nature, to turn it around? Or is nature always better than mankind? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Uh, of course, um, uh, uh, nature, mankind have have different uh, uh, solutions yeah, to solve uh, uh, problems. Um, uh, we have, for instance, aeroplanes, uh, which which can be very heavy. That 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 would never be. Uh, and nature could could not, uh, all, although it is. It is nature because we designed it, of course. But um, after all, but um, uh, but um, yeah, muscles. Um, um, the muscles uh, generate the power of motion systems in animals, and um, they have advantages above above uh, motors uh, because they can operate at a very low temperature. But this low temperature actually limit, uh, say, the power output, yeah. Yeah, the power density of the system. Yeah, so the, the the low temperature is 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 an, an absolute advantage. Uh, but if you um, if you go beyond that, um, yeah, being able to uh, to fly with uh, with an airplane around the world is of course of going uh, going with uh, with all kind of of machinery to march, yeah, that is uh, that is of course uh, beyond, uh, say, organisms to do and uh, this on their own. So, actually, the symposium then ends with hope. Yeah, so it started with a product. It ends with a lot of question, but also hope that maybe we can even develop something better than nature. That is that would of course be nice. Yeah, it depends. It, 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 it will depend on your applications. I was I was very enthusiastic about what I saw this afternoon. All the all the inventions made uh, to do to do uh, surgery. We we really need that, of course. So I I have the highest respects for all those inventions, actually. So. Is there anything, uh, Benoit and Emmanuel, that you would like to add? Or shall we, shall we, shall we slowly close this? No, session? I just, I would like to thank everyone. I, I would like to thank Marianne Knight, especially for uh, all the organization and, and uh, the publication, the publicity through, uh, through the website was perfect. Uh, would also like to thank the speakers. Uh, one of our speakers indicated that uh, he could listen for hours more to Johan van Leeuwen, and I'm convinced that Johan van Leeuwen could actually talk for more hours. Yeah, but I think we'll uh, sure. have to do that do maybe it. next year <laughs> in the <laughs> next uh, conference. <laughs> next year, another topic: tree frogs uh, uh, or 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 squid tentacles or whatever uh, you would like. Yeah, super. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. Yes, thanks a lot. And uh, have fun, have inspiration from all these stories. So, wish you a bye fun bye. day. Bye, bye, thanks Emiliano. Thanks to the organizers for inviting us. Thanks to all the speakers for, for the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, as well. Yeah. Have a nice day. Okay, you thank too. you very much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. 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 B